Welcome to Masterpiece Online and to our talks program. This afternoon's panel discussion, Women Artists, Past and Present, will look at the role of women in art from the Renaissance to the present day. I'm delighted that so many of you have joined us this afternoon, this evening, or indeed this morning, as Christian um, has alluded to, from really all over the world. Um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Masterpiece, with its ethos of cross-collecting, the careful mixing of works from all periods and regions of the globe as a cohesive whole owes its success to the passion, connoisseurship, and to the scholarship of our exhibitors. In the absence of our physical fair this year, we are relishing the opportunity to showcase this knowledge to our existing and new audiences through our online talks programs, videos by our exhibitors hosted on our website, and short Instagram TV movies. Discovering about works of art through the voice of a passionate exhibitor has to be one of the most engaging ways to foster appreciation and knowledge. I would strongly recommend that you visit our Masterpiece website and our Masterpiece microsite on the selling platform Artsy, which I hope, I really hope you'll find re reflects the character of our physical affair. The website is a wonderful and exciting way to explore, and I think you'll find still allows the serendipity and opportunity to discover perhaps unfamiliar works of art that is such a hallmark of masterpiece. We are dedicated to supporting our cultural partners who are facing great challenges due to forced closures of public galleries and museums. And this year, we are offering unlimited free access to all artworks, conversations and content during Masterpiece Online at masterpiecefair.com. In return, we ask that you consider donating to the Masterpiece Cultural Fund to support museums in the United Kingdom, the United States of America, as well as in Asia. And a link to donate is included in the chat box. I'm particularly delighted this afternoon to welcome our moderator. Katie Hessel is an art historian well known for the Great Women Artist Instagram and podcast. The host of Dior Talks podcast, she has written and lectured extensively on the subject. Additionally, she has curated exhibitions for Victoria Miro and the Timothy Taylor Gallery, as well as looking after the annual residences of Palazzo Monte. Katie, if I may, I will now hand over to you to introduce our wonderful and distinguished panelists and to get the proceedings underway. Thank you so much and thank you so much for that lovely introduction and thank you everyone for joining today. I am so excited uh, to be here moderating this talk on women artists past and present. Today we are speaking to some of the world's most influential people in museums, galleries, the market and more. And I'm really looking forward to discussing the role of women who challenged and continue to challenge art history, but also the role of women in terms of gaining the recognition that they so rightly deserve. So without further ado, I am so excited to welcome our panelists. So today we are speaking to Joe Baring, the director of the Ingram Collection and co-host of the Sculpting Live Women in Sculpture podcast. Jo leads the strategy on public engagement with the collection and has curated exhibitions at museums and galleries across the UK. A former director of Christie's UK, Jo has recently been elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Art. Next, we welcome Corrie Jackson. She is the senior curator of the Royal Bank of Canada Art Collection. Based in Toronto, um, Canada, Corrie joined RBC in 2014, overseeing the management and strategy of the collection. Previously, she worked at the University of Toronto Art Museum, Sotheby's Canada, commercial galleries, and as an independent curator. Next, we welcome Richard Saltoon, the director of Richard Saltoon Gallery. Richard launched his own gallery in 2012, with the space now based in Mayfair. It's a fantastic space as of 2018. Since its, since its inception, the gallery has a strong focus on artists who have been underrepresented and to further enhance this. The gallery launched a brilliant 12 month program, all female campaign titled 100% Women in March 2019. Next, I'm delighted to welcome Letizia Trevers, the James and Sarah Sassoon curator of later Italian, Spanish and French 17th century paintings at the National Gallery here in London, a position she has held since 2000. 
2013, Letizia joined the National Gallery following a long career in the Old Master Painting Department at Sotheby's in London, where she was a senior director. Letizia has curated a number of exhibitions. I, I, there are too many to mention, but they also include Beyond Caravaggio, and she's also the curator of the very highly anticipated Artemisia Gentileschi exhibition. Next, we welcome Sarah Turner, the Deputy Director for Research at the Paul Mellon Centre for Studies in British Art in London. And she is also the co-host of one of my favourite podcasts, Sculpting Lives, Women and Sculpture podcast. Uh, next, we welcome Sarah Turner, oh, sorry, an art historian and curator and writer. Sarah has taught art history at the University of York and the Courtauld Institute of Art. A fellow of the Royal Society of Art, she was named one of Apollo magazine's 40 under 40 inspirational people in the European art world. She is also the co-editor of British Art Studies. And last but not at all means least, we welcome the fantastic Zoe Whitley, the director, the newly appointed director of the Chisholm Hale Gallery here in London. Prior to this, Zoe was a senior curator at the Hayward Gallery in London and curator of international art at Tate Modern. Exhibitions to her credit include curating the fantastic 2019 British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale and co-curating the highly acclaimed Soul of a Nation Art in the Age of Black Power at Tate Modern here in 2017 and many more. She also received her PhD from the Centre for Contemporary Art at the University of Central Lancashire. Now as you can tell, I mean we have some of the best people talking, the most, you know, influential people in the industry. So I'm really honoured to be speaking with all of you tonight. I'd love to just start with Letizia Treves, who has been instrumental in bringing female Baroque artists into our lives, namely with Artemisia Gentileschi. Artemisia was an artist who worked in a very male-dominated environment. I just want to start off by asking you, how were women artists treated in the Baroque and how could they bypass the norms to make sure that they were recognised but also remembered in 2020 the way that we know? Sure. Well, maybe we could bring up the first slide, at least have a picture by Artemisia while we speak. Um, I mean, the prejudice, there was certainly prejudice in the Baroque um, era, but also in the 18th and the 19th century. I think this prejudice towards women um, lasted for a number of centuries. And um, Artemisia Gentileschi herself, in a letter to a patron in the middle of the 17th century says, a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen, which is you know, her really acknowledging that there was this prejudice against women. But I think she really turned um, uh, what was essentially seen as a disadvantage into an opportunity um, because she also writes to the same patron, you know, let me show you what a woman can do. She really wanted to challenge um, this bias. But I think for women in her time, the bias sort of really existed from the very beginning, from, from their training, really, um, because, you know, a young male apprentice um, was able to wander around and copy the great Renaissance artists and antiquity. And Artemisia, as a young unmarried woman, just wasn't able to, to move around unaccompanied. Um, so a lot of these restrictions were really down to kind of restrictions within society on women. And I think another very important point is that women were generally excluded from the artists' academies. Um, and, you know, Artemisia herself uh, became a member of the Academy in Florence. Uh, Giovanna Garzoni, a very successful still life painter, became a member of the Academy in Rome. Um, but they were sort of honorary members. They couldn't take part in classes and drawing classes or meetings. And I think, I mean, Attending academies was absolutely key. You, you received essential training, but it was also where you met other artists, where you met potential patrons. And I think by not being part of this establishment, women were automatically excluded. Um, I think also, you know, one has to remember that Camisa wasn't alone. There were other successful artists um, in her time and also before her. But I think um, if maybe we could move to the next slide, um, we have to remember that historically women artists had really focused very much on the genres of portraiture and still life. Um, these were really more accessible genres if you think they didn't have access to male models or um, you know, they had to sort of make do with what was around them. So Sofonis Banguisola, some of her greatest pictures are self-portraits, you know, they could just sort of paint themselves from a mirror. Um, but Artemisia really um, is quite different in that regard, you know, because I think she tackles the kind of subject matter that male artists um, 
painted. And I think that really does distinguish her from her contemporaries. Um, and we know her own thoughts, both about her own work, but also her own worth, because we have all these letters, you know, that, that, that existed written by Artemisia um, to her patron. And she speaks of this injustice, the injustices against female painters. Um, in one instance, she says, you know, she produced a drawing for a patron and another artist took it and produced a painting. And she says explicitly, if I were a man, this would not have happened. Um, and she also defends her prices um, and, and she's constantly repeating the desire to be regarded sort of on a par with her, her male counterparts. Totally. I mean, you know, wait, I mean, it's so fascinating to hear about hearing about her. And, you know, we have to think, you know, 400 years old, we still know so much about this artist, but yet she is the first female artist in the 17th century to ever have a solo exhibition at the National Gallery. I mean, why do you think these stories have been almost hidden from major museums in the past, you know, despite this huge interest and hunger to learn about Artemisia? Sure, maybe we could switch to the next slide so we talk about her with her. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure, I don't know whether they've been hidden as such. I think I think timing is everything. Um, the exhibition that unfortunately was postponed in April due to, to, to COVID-19, and we're hoping to be able to, to stage it at some point in the future, um, that really came about because of an acquisition. We acquired her self-portrait as St. Catherine of Alexandria. And as a result, you know, the idea for an exhibition, but also um, the tour of the picture around the UK um, really happened sort of after that. Um, I, I mean, there have been other major exhibitions in the past on Artemisia, um, you know, in the 1990s and the, the, in 2001, a major one in America. Um, I think, you know, it is the first time we've staged it and the reason to do that now is obviously to sort of herald this, this acquisition. But it is also the first exhibition in the UK on, on Artemisia. And I think that is staggering. She even worked here uh, in the late 1630s. Um, but as I say, I think, I think we have to remember that the collection in the National Gallery spans a period of art, you know, from roughly the late 13th century to the early 20th century, where women just um, were not, did not have the same opportunities as men. And so naturally you have fewer, uh, you know, professional women painters, and therefore our collection has fewer of them. They aren't as well represented in our collection. And I think as a gallery, we have to find different ways to sort of engage um, audiences with our collection um, and also perhaps bringing in you know contemporary female artists as well to sort of um, you know reflect on our collection and we're doing that quite actively but I think she absolutely deserves a solo exhibition it's been a long time coming and it will happen so. <laughs> No, I, I, I can't wait. I'm honestly so excited for it. And Zoe, I'd love to move to you. You have previously, um, I mean, you know, congratulations, first of all, as well, on your recent director for Kitty Hall. That's absolutely fantastic news. But you've previously, you know, held a position such as senior curator at both the Tate Modern and the Hayward Gallery. I mean, what have you seen institutions do to place emphasis on women artists in the past years? Um, well, I think one of the big changes that I've seen institutionally is beginning to happen structurally. Um, and I know it's something that you've seen as well. So certainly when Frances Morris, for instance, um, took the helm of Tate Modern, um, part of the directorial vision that she made clear publicly from the start was that the um, exhibitions program, so you know what people think of as the kind of flagship, the reason why people other than tourists would kind of flock to a national museum that is, you know, always there and is open to the public, but to give people new and different reasons to come, that um, the exhibition program should be reflective of uh, the gender split within larger society, so that 50% of the exhibition program would be dedicated to women and women identifying artists. And that is just one example of the types of, um, proactive ways of of not just relying on the fact that well things have always been this way you know it's a kind of galvanize the change that we need to be seeing institutionally we see it happening in the states at places like um, the baltimore museum of art which um, their um, acquisitions program for this year um, kind of seeing 2020 or 2020 vision i don't want to get the the term wrong but where they're only bringing in um, works by women and women identifying artists um, with 
their acquisition fund for this year. So there are ways in which those of us in positions of power or relative power can use that to address what had previously been um, these kind of absences within the, the official histories. Yeah, I mean, you curated the hugely successful exhibition, Soul of a Nation, Art and Age of Black Power, which really opened up the UK, and obviously it's been toured uh, worldwide, but really opened up the UK, I think, artists who I never even studied or knew about before, despite the fact that they've been working for decades and also were very much recognised in parts of America. How important is it to bring these new names to British institutions and kind of to what extent can we take these risks? Um, I think we have to take these risks. And actually, I think that often we end up seeing that they're not risks, that the same rigor and scholarship that had been brought to the canon as was um, can expand the canon and change the canon. And the canon doesn't have to be something that's fixed. And so from my point of view, I think it's always important to look at what we can continue to change and to push. Um, if we go to slide number five, um, we can look, for instance, at um, an assemblage work by Betty Saar called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. This was made in 1972 and was first shown um, in Berkeley, California um, at Rainbow Sign, um, a Black cultural center. And what you have here, um, for me, so much crystallizes a number of the issues that I feel are important and that I've talked about or written about elsewhere, um, because I think we always have to bear in mind, even within a context such as this, of feminisms in the plural, um, to think about um, what it means to redress uh, a gender imbalance, but if that gender um, redress only represents white women or women of a certain class, then it still isn't doing the full work that we all have to commit ourselves to. So um, an important uh, cultural activist, um, lawyer um, and philosopher named Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 gave us the concept of uh, intersectionality. So what it means to think about uh, gender and race <laughs> and class or these complex positions um, and not to flatten or reduce things. And effectively with an assemblage like this one of Betty's, we have all of that happening as this mise en abîme because she's taking uh, a piece of racist memorabilia, um, this mammy figure that you have in the center that's three dimensional um, and this recess where you have the, the chromolithograph um, would actually have been the place where a notepad would have been. So this type of memorabilia was a notepad holder. And do you see that she has a broom in one hand and the artist has replaced a rifle in the other, but that would have been a place where a pencil could have been held. So within the domestic setting, um, it would have likely been um, an African-American woman, a domestic in service of a white family, having to potentially write down that more butter or sugar or flour was needed on the next outing to the market, um, being mocked in that context in which she's working. So the ways in which we can think very rigorously about um, formal art historical concerns, um, but at the same time be aware of how that affects our daily lives in relation to um, labor and domesticity and politics or things that so many artists have taught me and something that I think is important for us to bear in mind. Um, and I'll just wrap up with a really lovely um, way of distilling these, because I think these are really heavy themes for people. Um, but if we take uh, a writer like Alice Walker, and when she talked about womanism, um, by her definition, um, womanism is to feminism as purple is to lavender. So the fact that you can have this brightness and this intensity and be able to think about um, love and respect and wanting to think about the whole person and all its complexities are things that I think are really important for this conversation. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much, Zoe. That was wonderful. Richard, I want to move to you. You have a history of showing particularly feminine, feminine stuff from the 70s. I particularly love your program. Why did you choose to dedicate your program to this? And could you tell us maybe about a few of the artists who you spotlight? Um, we, we uh, you know, as a gallery, we always want to be on the lookout for figures who are fresh, and uh, under 
represented and coming from an art historical background um it it, it was maybe 10 years ago almost natural that all the underrepresented artists you would find would be almost by definition female and it was almost um uh, it almost became part of our remit for, for the team to you know to to research and discover these figures um uh, we were able to bring them into the gallery. We were able to show important work, important historical work, and to show it at a price which we felt was very fair. Um, and that's um, and that's how it really started. Um, and we built up a certain amount of critical mass. And so, a couple of years ago, when we came to plan our uh, yearly exhibition program we just realized that we had eight exhibitions uh, by female artists and therefore we could bring it all together um, under one theme which is which is which is what I like to do to have the exhibitions tie in um, and so that developed into 100% women yeah, it was a fantastic program. So, I mean, you know, as a gallerist, um, do you find that collectors are more interested in this work now, or do you think they've always been interested in it? Um, I think that there is, uh, I, I think that there is increasingly uh, a new uh, generation of female collectors. Um, some of whom were very fortunate to be able to work with. A lot of them are um, with independent means. But, but however much, from a market point of view, however, however much we like to talk about diversity, the reality is, is that we're only really talking about 5% because as far as the market is concerned, the 95% is still tied up with very famous men. You know, that's where the money goes. And, and most, and a lot of male collectors that I've met are still very intimidated by female artists. Goes back to the, maybe a little bit to Artemisia. You know, how much do the, do the male patrons get intimidated by a woman artist because it shows the world from a different point of view and as long as the as long as the, the men have the money then maybe that's the view they don't want to spend their money on yeah i mean joe i'd love to bring you in here because you are you know tell, tell us about the ingram connection collection you obviously manage this collection i mean how how what's your input with making this a kind of equal collection well what's really interesting so the ingram collection actually started off as a private collection um put together by someone called Chris Ingram. It encompasses the 20th century and also contemporary art. Over the last few years, we've showcased it. It's now publicly accessible and we show it at museums and galleries across the UK. What's actually really interesting is that in terms of acquisition wise, I didn't really need to do um, anything deliberate to um, kind of make any changes to the gender balance because interestingly, and Chris himself wasn't really aware of this in terms of the modern British um, collection that we've got. You know, when I arrived, I looked at it and I said, Chris, you've actually got an incredible holding of work by women artists. You know, they're kind of the one of the, the artists of whom we, we've got the most works by is an artist called Elizabeth Frink. There's, a, there's an image of her on slide 17. And so we've got 28 works by Frink in the collection. We also do a prize for young artists. And, and within that, again, you know, I don't deliberately ensure, I don't have to deliberately ensure that there's a gender balance because I think maybe that's the demographic of art schools at the moment um, in terms of women students. But we have a tremendous amount of really high quality works by young women artists. And last year we awarded three prizes, two of whom were to young women. But what I have had to do within working with the collection is, is visibility. So I've been really, I've had to do a lot of work in terms of the museum shows that we do, working with curators and museum directors to ensure that the works that we have in the collection get that airtime. 
So for example, I'm doing a show of women artists from the Ingram collection this summer at the Lightbox in Surrey. And that's going to be not just the kind of the modern British, that museum named artists like Hepworth and Frink, but also our younger artists, just to give them some oxygen, some visibility, and that first kind of opportunity to have a museum show, I think is really, really important. Yeah, I mean, you and both Sarah, I mean, you, 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 you have this fantastic podcast called Sculpting Lives, I mean, which really tells the stories of these women. I think that's something that we're missing as well. It's, you know, it's the sense of who they really were. I mean, I mean, I'd love to hear from both of you about this podcast and how it really came about. Well, it came about because Sarah and I were having a conversation and during the conversation, we made the observation that actually the majority of our, well, or a considerable amount of our most well-known women artists are actually sculptors. Um, so Zoe obviously worked with Kathy Wilkes in Venice. Um, we had Philida um, Barlow at Venice before her. You know, if you look at the 20th century, there's Barbara Hepworth, that sort of titan international icon of, of modernism of the 20th century, a sculptor. And yet we didn't really feel that people had put those stories together. Yes, yeah, so there's Barbara Hepworth there, you know, dominating. That's the United Nations Plaza in New York. And she got that commission in the 1960s. But what we discovered talking to artists is that we really wanted to discuss the obstacles that women sculptors face. So it's really hard making a career as a sculptor, but in particular as a woman. And even going back to Letty right at the beginning, talking about Artemisia and not being allowed in the academies, the first female sculptor to be elected as a royal academician in England was in the 1970s. And if you think that's an institution that's been going for 250 years, it's quite surprising. Um, and also within that, Philida Barlow, when we interviewed her, said that in the 1960s at art school in London, the kind of, you'd think that's the swinging 60s, you know, really height of opportunism. There was actually a sign on one of the doors in her sculpture studio, in the sculpture department, saying, no ladies in the welding room. So if you're not allowed to learn how to handle these materials, you know, how on earth can you make a career? And what Sarah and I were really interested in was also that kind of dichotomy between the real physicality of sculpture, you know, the heavy, hard materials, bronze, iron, welding, you know, you need face masks. And that idea that that's somehow not something that's suitable for women. You know, when you look at Barbara Hepworth, so many people comment on the physical nature of that. So she's this tiny petite woman and yet people seem to have a disconnect between A, just her physical ability to make such large scale works like we saw in front of the UN, but also that kind of ambition that she had to do that. And I love, there are some great photos of her posing really proudly alongside them. You know, she's got her sort of feet up beside them. She's got her elbow alongside her as if to say, this is mine, you know, I made this. Um, so within our podcast, Sarah and I really tried to uncover those hidden stories and those obstacles. Totally. I mean, you know, it's worth point, point, you know, same with Artemisia, she was someone who really took up space as well. And also, you know, to Richard's point as well, you know, there is huge disparity between women who actually come out of art school and those who actually end up being um, professional artists, especially sculptors. Sarah, I'd love to bring you in here to talk about, you know, contemporary sculptures and sculptors and why, I mean, you know, we see these great, you know, we, we know so much about these historic ones, but perhaps what are the obstacles that contemporary sculptures still face today? I think that was one of the really interesting things for um, Joe and I looking um, across the 20th and 21st century was to see that some of the challenges that artists were facing um, in the early 20th century, actually some of those structural issues still remain the same about, like Joe was saying, access to education, um, exhibitions, who gets exhibited, who's been taught in art history courses. So I think some contemporary artists and sculptors are still dealing with some of these really um, structural challenges. Um, and I think, you know, it's our job as people who work in the art world, whether that be as curators, as art historians, is to think about um, some of these bigger questions. We, it's important to tell individual stories and hear about incredible lives and incredible journeys, but how do we piece all that together? How do we you know, address some of those structural issues and start to force change to happen um, and be part of that change? So I think, again, taking a longer view helps you sometimes stand back and think, what are the issues we're facing now? And you know, how has this changed? How has the situation not changed as well? And, and sometimes it's quite frightening how glacial the, the, the pace of change can be in the art world. Maybe now is a moment where things are, there's a, you know, there is a pressure to speed things up. So, and it's interesting, we looked at, um, if I can just give an example, 
a sculptor called Kim Lim um, was one, uh, one of our um, episodes focused on um, Kim Lim's work and, and we've got um, a slide of her. She came from Singapore uh, to London in the 1950s to um, attend art school here. And there are actually 80 works by Kim Lim in British um, national collections. So she's you know, fairly well represented, but has not had anywhere near the attention of other artists um, of her generation. I mean, she was taught by Anthony Caro. And so again, asking questions about not only her gender, but also about her race. How was she positioned in the British art world? Um, and I think, again, those are really important questions to ask, um, going back to what Zoe was saying as well, about perhaps it's not enough to look at gender and biography alone, um, and just to think about some of those wider um, issues as well that an artist like Kim Lim um, faced. And even though she's well collected, how do we make her work more visible within, um, the, within the gallery, uh, within the market, within the art history books as well that we write? Totally, totally. It, it's education, it's visibility, it's all those things. But Corey, I'd love to bring you in. You know, how is it being in charge of, you know, this actually kind of ties into Richard's point quite nicely, the fact that, you know, I'm sure you are dealing with, you know, a large number of male colleagues of yours. I mean, how is it being in charge of a Royal Bank of Canada art collection and how do you as an individual get to place emphasis on women? It's a wonderful question and I think it's something that has been thought about in terms of the collection for I'd say decades. Um, the collection itself is grounded in the idea that it's there for its audience and that audience is all of our employees, it's our clients, it's the communities that we're in and I think that that has really grounded a collection strategy for myself and for my team that thinks about equitable collecting around women, around black, indigenous and artists of color, how do what we put on the walls reflect the employees, the people who are coming into the spaces and also the values of the organization. I think the wonderful thing about artworks are that they're a tool for us to kind of go in, reflect, create dialogue for innovative conversations to see things from a new perspective that we might not have before. So the more diverse we can create a collection the more conversations can be brought forward. And I think it's been interesting just hearing where Sarah and Joe were speaking about, you know, the infrastructure around supporting artists and throughout their careers, especially around welding and sculpture. Our focus of our collection is also based on living artists, living Canadian artists for the most part. A lot of them are quite young. And when we think about who we work with and what we want to present, I want to make sure that we're not just going to a gallery system, but many of which have systemic and institutional structures that don't allow for equitable representation of women or other artists. But what can we do when we bring those artists in to also give them the tools to get those opportunities going forward? So if you go to slide, um, I believe it's slide 19. It's an image of uh, myself working with the artist Vanessa Maltese. She's a young artist um, based here in Toronto. And we were working on a site specific installation. And this was the first time that Vanessa was able to work with fabricators, work with large scale materials. And those are barriers for her to be able to get further opportunities for large scale public installations. So it's important that when we collect, we really think about, since we're working with young artists, what can we do to give them the tools and resources to further their career? I think because we're also working with a historical collection, you can close the slide, thanks. Um, we're thinking a lot about how do we engage with those young artists and addressing the gaps in the collection. We're not going to be collecting retroactively, but we can work with young artists going forward, have them come into the collection and think about what's the role of their work um, in bringing more breadth, depth, um, and context to the collection. So if you look at slide 20, this is a recent commission that we did for, for the RVC collection with the artist Rajni Pereira. And it's an image of a traveler. Um, what we did is we had her come into the collection, go through a number of our spaces. She saw a number of artists who had taught her, who had mentored her, that she was influenced by. But she also felt that there was gaps in terms of how she wanted to, what she wanted to see within the collection. So she created this wonderful portrait. It's non-gendered. It's about this individual who's navigating a future space, um, a future world. Uh, can see that there's not necessarily a moment in time, but a integration of many different perspectives coming forward. So 
Let me close the slide. Thank you so much. We're constantly, when we're looking at artists to incorporate into collection, we want to think about what are the ideas that they're bringing forward and how can they forward what's in our spaces and make the RBC offices kind of a little more engaging for that and for all of our employees. Totally. I mean, I think what's really interesting is, you know, you are all such kind of pioneers in your own fields. But, you know, I think it's interesting because we, we're kind of living through this world at the moment, which is, you know, fourth wave feminism. But how do we actually allow something like this to actually stick and make sure it's not a trend? Maybe we could start with someone like you, Zoe, who is, you know, taking the helm of one of the most incredible British institutions. Yeah, I think, well, that is exactly what is important in terms of thinking about um, an organization's mission and um, as a director, how an agenda is set that is also sustained. Um, so at Chisholm Hale, we, we believe in artists, um, we nurture artists through a process of critical friendship, usually at um, a very kind of pivotal point in their career. So um, for instance, an artist like Lubaina Hamid had a solo exhibition at Chisholm Hale in 1989. In 1988, um, an exhibition called Essential Black Art um, was a group show that included um, the next artist representing um, Britain in Venice, um, which will now be in 2022, um, Sonia Boyce. Um, and then also many other artists that we think of very much as having established what we think of as um, a visual identity for um, British contemporary art, um, whether that's Cornelia Parker or Rachel Whiteread, um, more recently Lynette Yadam Fwachi or um, Anthea Hamilton, to name only a few. So I think as we progress, having that history to build upon um, makes the future direction of travel um, that much clearer. You know, it would be a dereliction of duty to not be thinking in those ways. Um, and I think the more that a younger generation um, is having us uh, make further important inquiries into um, the binary nature of gender um, and the fluidity of gender, I think that we can explore that in other ways, but then ways that aren't about instrumentalizing an artist, but are being led by the artworks and about by what the artist has to say. Um, so as we go forward, I think the more that we're able to keep these kind of multiple thoughts in our heads simultaneously, I think a lot of the work will end up being done for us. I think the way that patriarchy or certain structures come into place, um, they become solidified by by not questioning them, by not thinking about them, and by having um, foregrounded that there are ways that we can, can question and to keep questioning and pushing ourselves, I think is the things that forge a territory so clearly. I really appreciated what Corey was saying just then about understanding that I think there's such a tautological aspect to the work that many of us do. And so, sometimes with decision making, certainly in, in big institutional structures, um, the people who get invited to do something or because there's an image um, or a physical object in someone's mind of an example of them having done it before. And so if it's possible to say, well, actually someone hasn't done this before, but I believe they can do it and we will give them the tools and the critical friendships so that they can. These are precisely the kind of ways in which institutions and structures can empower rather than disempower and to create um, more than just a transactional relationship to create um, the type of uh, generative rapport that I think curatorial work at its best is designed to do. Totally and Sarah you know as someone who is you know at the helm of an educational you know an institution I mean how are you enforcing you know diversity and inclusivity in your program? Well, I think one of the main questions we're asking ourselves is how do people get access to this information? You know, how are we, what are we doing in terms of publishing, in terms of events, you know, physically in our building in London, but online as well. Like, how are we distributing this new knowledge and 
you know, these new ways of thinking um, about artists and their lives and careers. So I think it's giving access to archives and libraries in new ways as well. Um, and I think that's what the work that an education institution can do. It's about that kind of collaborating. And again, perhaps not with the, the people that you've always collaborated with, making these new partnerships and thinking about the narratives that we have yet to tell. But I think it's not enough to just make things visible. I think it is, it's about sustaining that visibility, but also giving funding, giving support. Again, it's these bigger infrastructural issues that I think actually underpin change. And, um, you know, as well, as you well know, Katie, as well, thinking about new ways of communicating and getting information out there, like podcasting, um, you know, are the ways that actually get into people's bedrooms, living rooms, in ways that we're not expecting everyone just to come to us. Can we communicate what we do in different ways that are powerful and give people just new routes into the, to the, to the work that we're doing and engage with us in different ways. So I think it's that kind of thinking about communicating this work is so important. Totally. And I just love to um, end as well, you know, Richard, um, what I find so interesting about the artists who you look after, you know, so much of them are performance or their kind of alternative mediums to the sort of traditional sculpture painting and photography. I mean, Zoe, you referenced Betty Starr, who has a history of creating work with washboards. And, you know, all these really interesting materials that women, I feel, are particularly experimenting with. I mean, from a market point of view, um, how interested are collectors with women who are experimenting with these particular materials? Um, well, from a market point of view, of course, a lot of the market for the last five, ten years has been institutional and institutional markets are able to take those risks that uh, that private individuals may not be able to take. Um, it's actually also very satisfying because because one of the things about these new media that these artists have taken up is that the market hasn't really been able to commodify it in the way that it's commodified almost everything else, which meant that it has still remained a, an interesting market, but one that hasn't been kind of overblown. But it is fundamentally true that most of the performance market is probably institutional. That's fascinating. Okay, I'm, I know we are coming to the end of our um, session, so I'd just love to jump to questions. I think there's a really interesting one from an anonymous attendee, which is uh, to all of you. Um, do you believe there is a definable female sensibility in art, and does this create an inherent difference between male and female art? Well, I start because it's because Artemisia is the earliest. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a definite yes from Artemisia. I think it was really her great success lay on the female sensibility she brought to these well-known subjects, um, you know, from the Bible. So Judith and Holofernes and, uh, and but, I mean, my very first slide was a horrifically violent uh, scene of the beheading of Holofernes. And what I mean by female sensibility is she puts herself in um, really in the shoes of her protagonists. And I think, she, you know, it's really what gave her the edge. And I think collectors knew that when they asked Artemisia to paint a picture with a female protagonist, they would get something different from her precisely because she brought this sort of female perspective. It's very much what I argue in the show as well. Definitely. Anyone else like to answer that? I just think it's really interesting in terms of um, 20th century artists. So if you think about Barbara Hepworth, um, she was asked a lot about gender and the impact that that had on her practice and the work that she made. And right at the beginning of her career, you know, she absolutely refuses to say that she has a kind of, there is this feminine sensibility that she brings to it. And even after she makes a work like Mother and Child, having just given birth, you know, she says that there is, there's not that connection there. And it's later on, when she's able maybe to look back and has more confidence and is more uh, kind of has more confidence in her career and is more has more status almost that she's able to say and identify those aspects in her career so there was a time in the 20th century where and the same with elizabeth frink it was very much do not define me in terms of gender at all i'm on i'm on a par and yet later on in the in the younger artists that we interview particularly someone like rana Begum, they're very open about that kind of sensibility and what and what that brings to the work Totally. I think it's a, 
if you don't mind me adding in, I think it's a really interesting question. A lot of the younger artists we work with, and I'm actually going to bring up a slide, slide 21, if that's okay. The work by Esma Mohammed that we acquired recently, and it's been interesting seeing both the conversations that stem from it, but then also what was the approach of the artist going in, and she, she's questioning and looking at ideas of gender and representation and assumptions of femininity versus the masculine. And, you know, it, it's interesting because that's what's taken up in the dialogues when people are looking at it. I would say that there, whether or not it's made by a female artist isn't so much the question of why is this being presented in this way and what's the experience that's led to this presentation. Can you take it down? That's, thank you. But it, it, I think it's a, it's a complex question for a lot of young artists who are also trying to understand those definitions of gender through their own lived experience, not just through their work. Definitely. Anyone else like to add anything or shall I move on to the next question? Um, this is what I think probably more for Zoe uh, and in institutional uh, as well, which is how do you create equality within your institutions for artists who are not only women, but also mothers? Um, that's a very good question. I think that I hope that some of that comes from uh, a place of empathy. Um, I am a mother. Um, the deputy director of Chisholm Hale is also a mother. Um, I think it has to do with uh, changing norms societally as well. I mean, we know that there were artists, even in the 90s, who um, made a very big point that it's not possible to be both an artist and a mother, and they made a choice. Um, and again, so I, I feel like I'm saying similar things, but and again, this, this kind of, I think, very liberating rejection of binaries, you know, that things don't have to be either or, but that you can be both and. Um, there are, of course, uh, wonderful examples of that, not only throughout art history, but also in more recent times, uh, Kathy Wilkes being just one example, um, that what we find, and we find it more now, I mean, you're in my living room because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, there, I think the, the goalposts are changing in relation to what professionalism means or looks like, and what that means, we, what we can ask for um, in terms of vulnerability or, or stating things that we, we just may need, you know, whether that's time to breastfeed or you can only reach me during these hours and that doesn't have to mean that um, there's any wavering in commitment just because someone isn't available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to, you know, say, answer an email or um, to contact a fabricator or whatever it might be. Um, so I think a lot of that comes down to um, hopefully being as human as possible and to being um, mindful that what it means to be professional doesn't have to be a caricature of uh, a kind of patriarchal work structure from a previous century. Like Definitely. Japan, because Artemisia yeah, is the sort of model, <laughs> a sort of 17th century model of this, because um, just thinking about what Joe was saying before about the physical challenges for female sculptors just dealing, you know, and obviously the physical challenges for painters too. Um, you know, Artemisia had five children in five years. I mean, she was pretty much pregnant for five years. And it was the crucial years where her career really took off, you know, after she sort of came out of her father's studio and set up on her own. And in the middle of all of that, between children, she became the first woman to become a member of the Artists' Academy in Florence. I mean, it is a really astonishing thing to remember, you know, not just Artemisia, the painter, but Artemisia, the mother, the wife, the lover, you know, and there is, it's a much more sort of multidimensional view of the artist practicing her art alongside all the other responsibilities that women, particularly in the 17th century, were required to sort of, um, to fulfill. And um, I mean, four of her five children died, but her daughter Prudencia, actually, she trains her to be a painter. Um, and she moves with her eventually to Naples. I just thought it was an interesting thing to think about in relation to Zoe's comments. Could I just make a quick um, point that came up just through the interviews that we did with some of the living artists for Sculpting Lives was um, that often recognition for women artists comes relatively late in their careers. I mean, apart from a few big names that we know about, for a lot of 
those women artists, their, you know, their reputation takes off towards the end of their career or when they're dead, which quite frankly, it's too late for them. Um, and so, you know, those kind of are really kind of, um, you know, those issues are real problems to cover to face, aren't they, about how do you help an artist sustain a career from leaving art school to maybe, you know, what's a mid-career moment when lots else is happening in your life, in your um, career, through to, um, you know, sustaining a long um, career um, with everything else that's going on. So I think that is something that, you know, really comes up. When do we give people recognition? When do we allow them to have the monographic show write the books about them and um, again we follow fairly conventional formats and i think it's you know up to us, us to ask do those formats need to change yes can Definitely. i just uh, just in response there so we interviewed Anne barlow who's the director of tate st ives about exactly this issue and she was really open about her desire to support that kind of mid-career artist because there's a kind of a almost like that kind of excitement at the beginning and then as, as Sarah said you know a, a reassessment at the end but people are being lost in the middle particularly women particularly mothers and that's something that she really identifies as something they support and she gave a residency to Rana Begum who's one of the artists that we cover and we interviewed in the podcast who again was really open about about the problems and that kind of juggling and having a studio being at home um, just uh, quickly is also how to consider how that feeds into the practice so when we interviewed Phila de Barlow she said obviously she has famously has five children and she, there was a time in her, her career when she could only work at night she used to go to her shed at the bottom of the garden and make work and actually then that's how she became interested in those kind of really dark pieces and the kind of night imagery of that kind of period in her life really fed into the practice so I think that's interesting to consider as well yeah please go Zoe <laughs> I just want to read out because one of my all time favorite quotes is Phyllida's quote about success. And she says that success happens in all sorts of ways. There's sensational success, there's youth success, and there's the lifetime success of an artist keeping going against hell and high water. I'd like to think I represent all those artists who heroically have kept going and are successful, but are not recognized or acclaimed. I just think it's absolutely amazing. Perfect. We love Phyllida. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the next question is about Philida as well from, uh, from Bridgette, which is uh, Philida Barlow's success as a woman sculptor despite her regular use of low value materials and perhaps unusual. Is there generally a bias in the art market against women sculptors who use less macho sculptural materials? Um, well, I, I can go for a bit before Sarah, but um, what's interesting is, is, is how it's not the market, but almost how institutions can show those low grade works. So for example, we went up to Yorkshire Sculpture Park. It's very easy to show a big bronze outside, but how can you show a work by Phila de Barlow outside? You know, how long is that gonna last? So you have to think about those low grade materials or those more ephemeral materials. Can institutions show them? And the market generally follows institutional support. It was also interesting, um, sometimes the myths that grow up around artists, because Phyllida said that she, you know, she reads endlessly um, about um, people saying that she surfs from skips and gets her materials you know, from the street. And she said, she absolutely doesn't. You know, she, <laughs> she's buying in this wood. And, and so again, just sometimes the, the, yeah, the myths that can grow up around a certain artists and the materials they use as well. But it, yeah, I think there, there is a, there's definitely um, narratives that are attached to certain materials. Like Joe was saying, you know, bronze has this such a long history about being um, the medium of public art. And as we're seeing at the moment as well, the kind of history that's attached to the symbolism um, and the iconography, not only around the subjects that represent, um, but, um, you know, what is the symbolic meaning of the material um, and who is represented. And I think, again, sculpture is, you know, occupying such um, a space, a public um, role in our debates at the moment. It's, you know, it's important that we kind of keep talking about the role um, that sculpture is playing and, and how many um, of those sculptures by women as well. I think that's something that perhaps hasn't come up so much in or, um, or of women and of women, absolutely. <laughs> totally. I think what you're all saying is, is so interesting, and I, I, I just want to bring in something shortly, which is you know, I was talking to Lubaina Hamid uh, for a talk the other day, and she was saying that um, for the first time ever when she went, went to Courtmere Studios when she was in her 50s or 60s, she had space, and you know, for the first time ever, she had access to the studio that 
all her sort of male predecessors had had access to. It's the same with, you know, having access to the foundries, having that support, having that financial support from whoever, whether it's institutions or collectors or anything. I think it's really interesting. But I've got one final question uh, to end on, which is um, now that COVID-19 has accelerated the move by the general populace online, do you expect to see a wider audience for work in private and public galleries? And is this a watershed opportunity for the, democratiz the democratization of access to art and for all kinds of artists, not just female artists, who are tech and publicity savvy to get wider audience? Or do you think that the public will retreat to the norms when the new more normal sets in? I guess you know. Do you, do you, do you see this? How, how do you how do you see the kind of new normal in museums after COVID? Uh, after we get used to a new normal, maybe. Well, can I speak for the gallery? Um, I mean, the National Gallery website has had a huge surge, obviously, of online activity. We produce new online programs and so on, and I think we've realize what works, what doesn't work. We've definitely got a younger audience engaged with our collection, which is great. And the challenge for us will be to get that audience out of their living room and into the building when we finally reopen. Um, I don't think people, I think there is generally a craving for all of us to just be in front of the art objects again. I think everyone's missing that hugely if you're interested in art. Um, I don't think one thing replaces the other. I think it can enrich. Um, so I suspect it, it what it's done, it hasn't necessarily changed the way you are in front of objects, but it will definitely um, enhance the digital going forward, even when, you know, museums and galleries reopen, I suspect. Anyone else to add anything? Well, I've just been struck kind of by when I've been attending panels myself or, you know, speaking on this one now, you know, and I look down and I can see we're speaking to over 190 people at one event. If we were doing this live, I don't know how big the, the room would have been, but maybe it would have been 50 people. Um, and so that is kind of interesting, I think, people joining, um, you know, not um, from all over the world and not just because they can be in London on a particular day, for example, um, as would have been the case for this event. So I do hope that we do keep um, some of this kind of... Um, well, the way that people have been enabled to participate in events through you know the online format i think has been really exciting actually in opening up the conversation um it has its own problems and obviously digital access is not um, equal everywhere but i do think it's a step actually in opening up some of these conversations totally well and um, if anyone has anything else to add um i just thank want you, to thank Katie. <laughs> we I just want to thank well yeah, done. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. No, 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 not at all. I mean, thank you so much. It's just been a total honour and privilege to speak to you all, and I'm just so excited. I'm so excited to see Artemisia at the National Gallery. I'm so excited to see what you do at the Chisholm Hill Zoe, and all of you. I think we're going to expect a really exciting uh, new normal in the art world post-COVID. I really, I have high hopes, and I'm very optimistic about it. So thank you all so much. Thank you.